College Football Nerds here talking Alabama, talking Texas A&M. We've got Josh, Nerd Josh, here to get nerdy with me and with y'all, and we're going to get into some stuff later on. We're going to talk about our model in a little bit, and as you may or may not know, we opened up the model on our website, collegefootballnerds.com. It's available to you for free to model any two teams and get the same simulations that we run on the show. It spits it right out. It's a lot of fun. Um, all right, let's get into this, Josh. Uh, Alabama comes out a three and a half point favorite on the road, Texas a and I've got some thoughts about that just based on who Alabama has been offensively this year. But in general, it, it makes a little bit of sense, right? Alabama's ranked like 11th or 12th in the country. Texas A&M, for whatever reason, is not ranked. I also tweeted about that today. Um, makes no sense to me that Tennessee is ranked and A&M is not but whatever. Um, But in general, if you don't know a lot about these two teams, you look at the numbers on the surface, um, it makes sense. Alabama's slight favorite on the road. Uh, A&M's probably getting some points there. Um, But when you look a little bit deeper, A&M, in my opinion, might be better at quarterback without who they started the season with. Um, And Alabama might be you know, just not great at quarterback at all. And if that's the case, being on the road, does this mean Alabama might really be in trouble? Uh, I think it does. Um, You know, Alabama struggled with Texas A&M the last two years. Uh, Very nearly lost last year had A&M just thrown an accurate pass. Uh, The year prior did lose. Uh, And there have been good reasons for it. Partly was due to scheme in, you know, 2021 um, it was the offense that carried the day more than anything for Texas A&M, though I will say defensively they were able to get some stops and Alabama was really cold for a while. That was a thing with Bryce Young with them, which I think is kind of interesting because it's continuing in the NFL. I know neither one of us was sky high on him um, and thought he had more limitations that were given credit for. Both of us thought C.J. Stroud should get drafted higher. I don't know that we were wrong on that. Sorry, Alabama fans, but I'm, I don't know that we were. Uh, now everybody just turned off. Uh, but... <laughs> The, the reality is that Texas A&M has been a thorn in Alabama's side. And I do think the, the thing that starts it all off is the front. So last year, Texas A&M had a lot of young players in the front seven, particularly on the defensive line, all the way through the two deep. And those guys were really athletic and disruptive, but they weren't great against the run. Appalachian State won because they were able to burn massive amounts of clock and sustain drives and push around Texas A&M. Basically, everyone that beat Texas A&M last year did it on the ground. Uh, And the thing is that Alabama on the offensive line has not been good enough to get a hat on a hat and get push. They've allowed guys to leak. They miss assignments. Um, And if you're like that versus Texas A&M, then their athleticism takes over. Uh, And so that's been the problem, I think, for Alabama offensively. And I think this is another year with great talent on the front for Texas A&M, an offensive line for Alabama that has not completely shown that they've gelled. And so you may have the same problem because A&M is better against the run, significantly better than they were uh, the last couple of years, especially last year. Um, they were, maybe it took a step back in pass defense than they were last season where they were really the top unit in the country in a lot of metrics. Um, and so you have an Alabama team with a new quarterback placing a very disruptive front with an offensive line that hasn't been good against disruptive fronts. Uh, and at quarterback, I think Texas A&M maybe has addition by subtraction with losing Connor Wegman. And let me explain that before I kick it back to you. Um, so I commented a couple times, uh, starting in the Miami game, Connor Wegman's pocket awareness just wasn't great. Uh, as a mechanics driven quarterback, he's good. He puts the ball in the money. He has really good arm strength. He's a good athlete. He has all the boxes you want to check. Uh, he's also pretty good from a rhythm and progression standpoint, but in terms of pocket awareness and pre-check, pre, uh, pre-snap pre checks, pre-snap reads, not great. Uh, the cat corner blitz problem is something that's well documented. Matt Wyatt is another creator we've talked to offline and online for years and a great guy. I, I suggest you go look at his videos because um, he, I think, identifies some of this stuff too. Um, Wegman does not see those corner blitzes. A lot of times you either need to shift your protection or you have to throw hot against it. But either way, it's often on the quarterback to realize what's going on and change the play, or if the play is amenable to it, to know the ball has to come out immediately. And I consistently have found that Wegman didn't do that. Uh, He didn't do it against Miami. 
uh, and then you know time went on, and then Auburn realized what was happening, and he couldn't do it against them either. Um, and so you end up with Max Johnson. And the thing with Max Johnson is he is not as good a quarterback as Connor Wigman. He does not run the offense as well as Connor Wigman does, which is why they don't start him. Because frankly, I think what Jimbo Fisher hates is that Max Johnson creates. He does not operate within Jimbo Fisher's offense. He operates Max Johnson running around in kind of a sandlot, sandlot football. But you know what? A lot of times sandlot football is better than Jimbo Fisher's offense. Um, so I do think Texas A&M maybe gets addition by subtraction with Johnson starting. And with everything else stacking up there, there are a lot of advantages that Texas A&M has in this game. And there's a lot of reason for Alabama to be concerned. Yeah, and, and I think that you mentioned Sandlot offense. That's all Alabama's running in the pass game right now. And, and Bama fans are going to be frustrated because they're going to say, hey, we just won a game 40-17 to 17 or whatever. You know, what are you talking about? <clears throat> but two of those touchdowns were defensive aided, one defensively directly. Um, and, and just if you look at, like, this is the kind of the, the if you the, you have to watch the game sort of thing. Because A&M fans, if they didn't see Alabama play, they might think, oh, Jalen Milrow had the highest SEC QBR of any quarterback this, this, this past weekend. He must be improving. In my opinion, at least what we saw Saturday, he was not. Um, he just only threw when there was a wide open receiver, except for one really good throw to Nye Black on a third down. He, took a, he walked into, left very good clean coverage or clean protection bailed the pocket and walked into a sack three of his four sacks um two of his sacks i think he just ran out of bounds like and took a five yard loss instead of just throwing it literally in the dirt he has an issue with not processing the field especially when the picture changes um just before the snap or right after the snap he knows where he's going to go with the football and if that's not there he will eventually process his reads but things are fall, going so slow and he's bailing so often that he's not getting those reps. The The broadcast team kept saying, you know, well, they're just not letting him throw. They're not letting him throw. They're calling pass plays. He's just not throwing the ball. Um, and so I think that there's an issue there when you think about he's more comfortable at home, it looks like, than he is on the road. And you see, you know, how rattled they were Saturday. It's going to be even louder probably this weekend um they are running the ball well having said all that josh the flip side is texas a&m still has to score and alabama in my opinion people are going to think this is silly too because they gave up 17 saturday they've given up some running yards they've got the best defense in the country and they've got one of the best defenses in the nick saban era Maybe a little bit less with loss and hurt, but that's not hyperbole. And you, I just was willing to kill the offense to tell you, this is the best defense I've seen in a while in Tuscaloosa. So even if Alabama's struggling on offense, a and still got still to find some points. Yeah, uh, so we've rolled out a lot of features on our website at collegefootballnerds.com. And again, I, I encourage you to go look at those. It's all free. Um, you can also run the model that we're going to talk about later. You can do it on the fly, any two games you want. All you got to do is put in a login, and that's also completely free. Um, but in those statistics, it takes what Alabama's defensive statistics are and, and just makes them look better. Uh, so relative performance and statistic, it, it's the same, a different name for the same thing we've been generating for a long time, which is a percentage of opponent averages. Uh, basically, if your opponents are averaging four yards of carry and you held them to two yards of carry, you were 50% better than their average. Uh, so we look at all the teams you've played. We look at how those teams did against everybody else and how they did against you. And we give you a percentage. You were 25% better than everybody that played your schedule or you were 40% better or 20% worse. Um, so rather than just giving yard per carry, yard per attempt, which in college football, who knows what that means when you look at opponents or yourself because it's so based on schedule, we're actually giving you a percentage where we're just relatively comparing you to all, all the other teams that have played um, each team on your schedule in turn. And in that regard, Alabama goes from a defense that was generally uh, somewhere between 10 and 40 in most statistics, 13th points per game, 14th in total yards per game, and suddenly they're 7th in points per game, schedule adjusted. They're 2nd in the country in yards per game allowed, uh, opponent per adjusted. In terms of passing yards per attempt, 3rd in the country. Rushing yard per carry, 16th in the country. There is no unit that is outside the top 20 statistically for Alabama in the relative performance statistics that we generate because they've played teams that are all pretty good offensively. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, they're sound for the first time in a long time. I haven't seen any major issues. Uh, the thing that Texas A&M killed them with a couple years ago was their inability, I think, to deal with uh, teams that like to throw to the running back more tight end, swinging wide. They've done a lot of stuff taking Nick Saban's defense, and they've moved it around where the outside linebackers catch guys going wide. We've talked about this for years. Uh, big key why Tennessee lit them up last year is because you could kind of dictate with certain formations that, hey, if we're split wide and then we roll the, you know, we take the running back and, and then we make him flare out on a pass route, Will Anderson is going to take him in coverage and we know it. And so instead of having to block him, you can just force him in coverage. They're a little more simplistic. They're a little more straightforward. There are going to be times when that makes them a little more prone to be exposed um, in terms of just athletically struggling with like a Clemson. But they're also going to be probably a lot less likely to be just flat out schemed like they were the last few years. And I think the end result is better. This is a great defensive unit. And I will say on the flip side with Texas A&M, you know, even Arkansas, that was a game where they outgained in a per play sense Arkansas by a significant margin. But they won by a very small margin, you know, 12 points, despite the fact that they were um, averaging over five yards a carry. Arkansas had 1.1 yard per carry. That's 42 yards rushing on 39 carries. Um, Passing was about dead even, though Jefferson only managed to get nine completions in the game. Um, The thing that's killing Texas A&M is inconsistency, and this is a bit of a problem with Max Johnson. Um, Turnovers, negative plays... He's just prone because he's playing Sandlot football to string in completions in a row. And so that is the flip side to this whole discussion is that when Texas A&M has the ball, um, Max Johnson can be a serious liability. I I do believe that against Alabama. We've seen Max Johnson play Alabama a few times with a couple different schools now. Um, At LSU, he was totally ineffective in a game LSU could have easily won a couple years ago. Um, And last year, I mean, he, you know, he's... He's a guy that's come in and played well, but I just don't think it's going to pan out for four quarters. And I think the potential for him giving points to Alabama is pretty high. So this does start to really feel like a game that's defensively driven, uh, both in terms of two offenses that may struggle to move the ball. And, and again, I didn't cover Texas A&M's uh, you know, relative, relative statistics offensively, but I'll say like in terms of passing yards per attempt when you adjust for opponent averages, they're 83rd. Um, so this is... This is a matchup that's definitely going to be driven by the two t- two defenses. Um, and I'll say Texas A&M's defense, by the way, s- relative performance, the top yard per or total yards per game defense in the country in our model, fifth in rushing, 38th in passing uh, on a per play average. Great defenses, offenses that both have their kinks, and you end up in an intense game, which is why it's a three and a half point spread. Yeah, and, and three and a half points to me, I, I think it's about right for the betting public. Um, I, I think that it's, you know, all the things that you talked about, if it really comes down to these two quarterbacks who can both get rattled and who love to throw the ball to the other team, you know, I'm, I'm really going to go advantage dude who's playing at home and has the crowd on his side. Like that to me is a little bit of an obvious one. Um, Alabama can also run the ball. They've, they've run the ball pretty well this year. And, and a lot of, it seems like college football now has completely left the feature back era behind. Um, and, and all of these teams are just running guys out there, uh, in just like line changes, like hockey. The one thing that's holding me back that I'm struggling with Josh, and maybe we can talk through this a little bit and you can be my therapist. Um, you don't. You don't pay me enough for that. It's hard not for me that, to not that you pay me, but <laughs> if you did, it wouldn't be enough. It, it, it's hard for me to think that Alabama can. You know, I think Texas has a very good defense. I, I, Texas A and M, in my opinion, probably has a little bit better defense. But Alabama clawed together twenty four points against Texas. They probably could have gotten to thirty without some of the really bad mistakes. Um. I feel like watching Alabama this year, you know, the Ole Miss game, 24 to 10, we talked about that last week. That game was a game where both teams ran with the new clock rules, just melted that game. So people are going to say, well, Ole Miss scored, gave up 49 to LSU and only 24 to Alabama. Alabama's offense must be trash. Some of that was, was limited. Now, they do have their issues. We've talked about that. Watching Mississippi State game, we know they were fooling around the South Florida game with different quarterbacks. Watching the Middle Tennessee game, 
I feel like Alabama's not – they're intentionally playing with one arm behind their back in some of these games they know they're going to win to force Milrow to be better in the areas where he's not good at all. One, do you think that's true? Yes. I mean, I, I, I have to think that's something they're going to do. Okay, so if that – and if you watch the Mississippi State game, the way they were calling that game, it really felt like that. There were no deep, deep shots. There were only a couple of design runs. If that's true, how much more can you expect from an Alabama offense against a really good defense if they open up the whole playbook? Is it really the Texas data point that we could expect against Texas A&M? I mean, there's a lot of similarities there because Texas A&M defensively is not that far behind Texas. They're just not. And I do think, look, Alabama's loss to Texas flat out probably is the best loss of any good team in college football. Uh, now, A&M's loss to Miami is on up there. Miami's a very, very good team. Texas has a real argument right now for being the best team in the country. Um, and that was a game that Alabama led in the fourth quarter. Now, not for their, very long, but they did. Um, but the concern is that a lot of the problems that occurred in that game are real. And, and Texas, I will also say, moved the ball better than they scored for much of that game. Um, yeah, I mean, you've hit on a lot of different aspects, some things that are difficult to sort of grapple with for people uh, and other things that are concerns. One, you're absolutely right. So I, I just went and looked at it. LSU ran 12 full possessions versus Ole Miss. Alabama only ran nine. Um, this is something we're all adjusting to this year is that football games are a lot shorter because of the clock rules. Teams typically had like 12 to 15 possessions in a competitive game. And again, 12 is all LSU got. Uh, Alabama getting nine. I don't know the last time that I've seen games where teams had nine possessions, and I've seen it a couple times now. Uh, there was a game recently, I forget which one it was, maybe the Notre Dame-Ohio State game, where one side had seven possessions, which is nuts. Um, well, you know, when when you have so few times getting the ball, the scores are going to be lower, and it, it people look so much at total yardage and points that they can't get wrap their heads around the fact that basically the game is ending what used to be the end of the third quarter. That is really what's happening. The game is ending a quarter early. Um, but to that point, if the game ends a quarter early and you have an offense that's starting slow, which Alabama's is, it doesn't leave you a lot of time to score, right? I mean, Mississippi State, I looked up their relative performance rankings. 104th in relative performance and, yard, and points given up. Uh, 86 in total yards. But this is the big thing to me. 125th out of 133 teams in uh, yard per attempt defense. It is one of the worst pass defenses in the country, straight up their 130th. Um, and Alabama completed nine passes in that ball game. And I don't care I don't care that they were just trying to focus on intermediate stuff. It had to be there. You couldn't see it on TV, so I can't prove anything to you. I couldn't even do a film breakdown if I wanted to, unless you were to give me the all 22. I do not believe that they didn't have people open. Um, I saw that game against South Carolina that they were getting torched left and right. Um, if you can't throw the ball and find guys open and get the ball out quick versus a horrific Mississippi State pass defense, I don't know how you're supposed to translate to a top 10 unit at Texas A&M because whereas Mississippi State's weakness was pass defense and they were a good run defense, you know, it's the same deal here, but literally twice as good you know 30 spots higher in run defense uh 80 spots higher in pass defense it is an entirely different animal this is much more like the texas game and i have not seen enough to make me think that alabama is necessarily going to get over that hump so the other side of this is the texas a&m offense you know i think that a lot of people for three quarters against auburn they didn't look great um, if I'm being entirely honest. Um, but I think what we saw Saturday against Georgia with Auburn is a new data point that recontextualizes what Texas A&M did offensively against Auburn, which was in look transitive property. We're not saying that this exactly means this, but they did better offensively than Georgia did, uh, against Auburn. So I think that A&M's got something there offensively, that even with a new quarterback, or maybe especially with a new quarterback, that we haven't seen for a while. And, you know, Alabama and AM both have new coordinators coming in this year. 
and both of them are even under ideal circumstances are going to take some time to click. So if you're looking and peeking at box scores from AM first couple of weeks of the season, uh, even that Miami game, it's probably a little bit different, you know, four weeks down the line. Uh, you know, a lot of times with teams that are very senior laden and they've got the same coordinators year over year, you're not going to have that much change in a team from September to November. Um, but for teams that have new coordinators and a lot of new personnel, you do see change. And you, if you catch them early, they might be pretty bad. In that regard, I feel like A&M has improved more, at least offensively. I think Alabama's defense, again, best in the country. But offensively, A&M has improved more maybe because of not having the same personnel limitations that Alabama has. Um, but I will say that Alabama's offensive line looks a lot better than it did even a couple of weeks ago. So what does the model think about this game before we get into our picks? Yeah, and I will note when you look at the model too that it doesn't necessarily look at just most recent results. So it's considering things like that South Florida game. And I do agree with you, Alabama's offensive line, who was more a mental assignment issue, like with the Texas game, than it was getting beat, though that did happen some. It was more just bad reps. And even, I say assignments, even when they were getting beat, a lot of times it was just complete busted technique. wasn't necessarily getting out physical. Um, but in the model, I mean, when it looks at the entirety of the season and the way our model works, um, I'll go ahead and say, you know, we released it. You can go on our website at College Football Nerds, play with it. Again, 62% against the spread. Uh, week one that we had it out there, which was crazy to us. Not sustainable, but uh, if it was, we'll be out on our boat uh, in the Maldives and you won't see us anymore. Um, it, it likes Texas A&M in this game. Um, it has a 24.7, 24. basically 25 to 21 Texas A&M. Um, but it's definitely a defensive slugfest. Total yards per play is projected 4.38 for A&M, 4.59 for Alabama. The interesting thing is um, Alabama is the only team expected to throw the ball, 7.9 yards per attempt to 4.9 for A&M. But this is where the model does have an understanding of tendencies, um, how the plays come, how often they come, and what their effect are. Alabama just doesn't throw it very much. Uh, again, nine completions against Mississippi State, only 12 attempts. It doesn't matter if you have a high yard per attempt average if you throw that infrequently. Those nuts. Realize those stats are what a lot of triple option teams look like around 10 to 12 attempts in a game. It, it is. Um, and Alabama has effectively rendered themselves a triple option team without actually running the triple option and getting its advantages. Um, so you end up in a situation where Alabama's running offense is at a 28% disadvantage. Um, uh, Alabama's uh, or Texas A&M's uh, run offense is at about a 1% advantage, actually, which is kind of the key in the model, I think. Uh, 3.8 yards per carry for AM, only 2.8 for Alabama. Essentially, AM is the only team that might reasonably run the football. Um, the biggest advantage on the board is that Alabama's pass defense is expected to pretty well dominate the game. Again, 4.9 yards per attempt for Texas AM is absolutely anemic, so they have to stay on schedule, is what that's saying. And this, the points are so low that it doesn't think they will. Um, it sees this as a defensive slugfest. It also sees this as a three-point game, the wrong, wrong team favored. Um, and we often say anytime the points are below 25, the odds of one punt return or something design the game, deciding the game get really high. It's almost always a game that gets decided in the fourth quarter. I often say that if you make a pick in a game and your pick is still on the table in the fourth quarter, you made a reasonable pick. I don't care how it goes in the fourth quarter. You can't project what team is going to give up or give up a late touchdown or throw an interception in the fourth quarter. Going into a game, there's no way you could ever know that. If you know what the situation is midway through the fourth or predicted that, you were a genius. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's as much as you could do. Um, and, and that's kind of what the model is saying is, look, they think this is going to be a game that comes down to the fourth quarter. It thinks this is going to be too close, uh, two low-scoring teams, tightly contested, um, but it but does pick t Texas A&M. And again, 25, uh, 24.7 to 21.1. So something around 20, 24, 21, Texas A&M. Yeah, you know, it's funny you talk about if your pick's still on the table in the fourth quarter. You know, a lot of people who do picks for a living, um, they only show you their wins. And they paint this image that, you know, somebody's out there picking 80% winners and they're not. Um, I, I read a thing the other day where, like, uh, most, most serial gamblers 
think they hit at a, they have a 70% hit rate, which is not true. I think a good professional gambler hits like 54, 55%, which is why we don't think that 62% on our model is sustainable. But to give you one example of that, our model was not covering late in the fourth Missouri versus Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt decides they had to, to try to win the game. They go for it on fourth on like, they're like 28 yard line or something. They go for like fourth and 15 and don't get it. And then Missouri pops just like kind of a late grinded out touchdown to cover the flip side of that. Our model, so our model cover there. Our model wasn't co- was covering Notre Dame Duke because it picked Duke to win outright, and so Notre Dame's driving. They hit a fourth and sixteen because of prevent defense, which is a whole other discussion. They hit a fourth and sixteen to get into field goal range. Had they hit that field goal, our model still covers because Notre Dame's a four point favorite or whatever. But they estimate breaks it unexpectedly when they weren't even really trying to score a touchdown. And then everybody who took Duke lost. So that's why, to your point, because it's such a good one, if you pick something that's still on the table in the fourth quarter, everything else, it's an oblong ball. It bounces funny. There's no way you can guarantee somebody's not going to get hurt, something weird's going to happen. Anyway, that's just an interesting aside. I'm picking this game now. I'm going with the model almost identical. I'm going to go Texas A&M 23 Alabama 20, I would swap this. I would maybe make this 27-20 Bama if it was in Tuscaloosa. I do think there's going to be a better version of Milrow than we saw last year, but I also think he's going to be – that's a tough place to play if you don't have everything in line. And we're still seeing Alabama with snapping in the dirt every third snap, which is throwing things off. They haven't got some of that stuff. So the little stuff that you need to have tight when you go on a road in a place like this – They don't have it. Um, 23 to 20, and one of those touchdowns is going to come from a short field because of a turnover. Yeah, and the the two anecdotes I'll say, uh, when when you picked me up to talk first reached out to me about co-hosting this podcast, which was a long time ago now, what, like eight years ago, more than that, um, I was doing a blog, and I'd won a big national pick-em for SB Nation and blogged about it, um, and I won it at 62% against the spread. And I won the national pick at 62%, meaning no one did 70 or anything close to it, picking like 25-point uh, games a week. And that was when I was, I'd gone back, to, gone back to law school, so I had more time on my hands. I, more than that, it was like over 10 years ago, I guess. Um, but, and, and I'll also note that the Florida State-Clemson game, I had Clemson against the spread. Of course, uh, Florida State goes into overtime and then scores a touchdown to win in overtime, and I was so bitter because if Clemson had just kicked the field goal, <laughs> you know, I went against the spread. And I was totally right to think that Clemson was going to give them a game because it went to overtime. But because they scored a touchdown, the way it worked out in overtime, right, they scored a touchdown and Clemson didn't score at all. Um, Florida State ended up covering, even though you were 100% to think right if you thought that Clemson uh, was unlikely to lose by that margin of regulation. Uh, I'll, I'll say in terms of score for this game, it's tough. I think either team could win. I'm picking Texas A&M. Um, I have it 2017, Texas A&M over Alabama. Alabama has a lot of issues offensively, and so do Texas A&M. I think Max Johnson's going to do some things that keep him in the game, and I think he's going to do some things that keep Alabama in the game. Alabama has not shown me yet, with Mel Rowe at quarterback, that they can put together a complete game. I think the decision for Alabama to start the other two quarterbacks, Tyler Buckner and Joe Simpson, and not play Milrow in the South Florida game, effectively loses them the Texas A&M game because they don't have consistency and cohesion. You need clean reps against bad opponents to get an offense in rhythm. Teams that have high-scoring offenses like Lincoln Riley's, they always play a lot of practice without contact. They do a lot of stuff where they're playing like is the worst possible defense they can. They get as many reps as they can for an offense because an offense is all about rhythm all about rhythm it's about getting knowing what it looks like when you snap the ball turn see the read and throw and if you're only letting somebody play in adverse circumstances they never get that rhythm and right now that's what i'm seeing with Jalen milrow this offense isn't consistent i I don't care what people say about his deep shots or his yard per attempt average Uh, milrow should be throwing the ball more than he is on the plays that are called he probably had 20 something pass plays called in that alabama game last week um, and he didn't throw the ball on a lot of them um, and that's not going to work against his front that is going to be far more active at Texas A&M, get far more pressure. 
um, anybody than Texas has done. And unless Alabama takes a massive step forward offensively, which I just can't see happening on the road at Kyle Field in front of that crowd, which, I mean, I've, I've been to a couple games there. It's, it's a darn tough place to play, and it can get loud in a game like this. I, I don't see them having enough offensively to win, and so I, I think they're just going to struggle and struggle and struggle. Um, Texas a and going to scrape points on the board, and Alabama's not going to be able to match it. Um, again, you know, I, I think Saban, frankly, mishandled the quarterback situation at Alabama. They needed to pick a guy and ride with it. I don't care if it was him or Simpson or what they did, but you cannot go into the season and then get to like week three, week four, and then make somebody the starter and expect the offense to have any idea, any identity, have any consistency. I know you, Al, Nick Saban's huge on a guy winning the team or whatever, uh, and there's a place for that, but it can also cost you. And, and I think this is a game where it's going to cost them. Uh, it won't shock me if Alabama wins. It will surprise me if they come out and fix a lot of the issues they have. I do think this is a game that is basically a coin flip. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this is absolutely a game where Alabama, not only can they lose, but on paper and just looking at the teams and how they match up, there's every reason to think that they will lose this ball game. So I would argue that the reason – Milro is the starter, and I agree. I think that they mishandled it, but I think that they mishandled it because of the standard that Alabama has. So, what they see is Milro has a massive ceiling, which he does. He's kind of like Anthony Richardson in that regard. He has a huge ceiling, and he's currently a bad quarterback. And so you want to give every other guy on the roster the opportunity to show that they can be good, not elite, but good, because then you would go with that other guy because your standard is a national championship. You're not, they knew in the spring, they knew in the summer, you're not winning a national championship with Milrow this year. So they're scrambling at that point because they know with Milrow they can win 10 games. Right, They know it, but they know they're also not going to hit their standard. Their standard is done before the season even starts. So that, in my opinion, is why they were given first-team reps to all these other guys throughout fall camp and even in the USF game to see, okay, can we find a guy that's good, not great right now? And they found out that they don't, and so they could have even worse disaster with one of those guys. Um, I think Simpson probably would be would have been the guy um, if he was a little bit better, uh, and, and, he just, and he just wasn't. Josh, anything else on this game? No, um, interesting one to watch, and I think probably the first time it's got to be one of like five times I've picked Alabama to lose in the last like five years. It's kind of crazy. Um, but I, I'm honestly kind of surprised that Alabama's even favored, and I think that's probably due mostly to public perception. Again, Texas A&M not being ranked is is a travesty in view of the fact that ten- Tennessee is having lost badly to a bad Florida team. Um, but I will also say that picking A&M to win this game doesn't mean that Alabama's bad. I think they're a top 15 team. I think Texas A&M is also just severely underrated. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that people are... Are it's it's funny to me because people are hugely influenced by forty eight thirty three against Miami, who's still ranked, but they're somehow not influenced by Tennessee getting dragged by a Florida team that's not even good. And I think that just goes to show how long brand perception can last. People still think that a, losing to Florida is not that not that bad, but Florida's objectively bad this year. Like they're not a good football team. Utah, without Cam Rising, sucks as a football team. Florida should have won that game if they were at all competent. So, you know, that's interesting to me because Miami is actually a good team this year, and and A&M's just not getting the credit. But to your point, you never pick Alabama to lose because you are chalk heavy and the sport's chalk heavy. So there's a read like, if you pick Alabama to win every game that we do for them, you're going to be right more than not. So... Um, I know I know I picked 2019 Alabama against Auburn to lose, and I was right about that one. I'll never forget because because you were wrong. Um, but A and M fans can run back to any of the many uh, very large fan forums, message boards, and share the news that the nerds have picked the Aggies. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great weekend or week, and uh, God bless. <laughs>